right. Welcome everyone to another episode of Unbottled Potential. I am really excited and honored today to share the work of someone who most of you who have ever experienced my courses or my teachings have heard of because I'm always talking about and sharing this, his book and insisting that people read it. Um, today, I'm so honored to have Gay Hendricks on the show. Gay, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks a lot, Amanda. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give a proper introduction that I'll record after this, but I would love for you just to share um, with everyone a little bit about your work and what your life's purpose is. Why are you here? Well, my life purpose is to expand every day in love, creativity, abundance, and life happiness as I inspire other people to do the same. That's been my life purpose for more than half my life now, and that's been basically what I've been doing in one way or the other. Uh, in the beginning, I was a university professor at the U uh, University of Colorado for a number of years teaching in the counseling psychology department. I taught people you know, how to be counselors and therapists, et cetera. And I did that for 21 years. And then Katie and I, Katie and I have been together for 42 years now. So again, more than half my life, we've been working and playing together. Um, she's also a psychologist. And so we began working with couples in the 1980s. And then at the end of the 1980s, we sat down and wrote a book called Conscious Loving and to describe the work we were doing with couples. And an uh, up and coming young talk show host named Oprah Winfrey called us and said, hey, I've heard about you guys. Come on my show. And so next thing you know, we and our book Conscious Loving are out in Chicago uh, taping Oprah and sort of life changed after that show came out. Actually. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> it was like I, we were selling, you know, like I think they said they we went from selling 10,000 copies uh, a month to selling 10,000 copies an hour. Oh, and wow. so it really changed our lives and and led to me deciding uh, we set up our own institute. I uh, as a university professor, I enjoyed it, but there were some things that I didn't like about it, you know, like at one point we had to give people a 500 question multiple choice test, you know, mm. and my position was what are counselors, therapists, social workers, why do they need to take a 500 question, uh, you know, in statistics, they had to take a whole year of statistics. And so here at my little private university, we only teach things that people really need to know. And so when you come here and work on one of our counseling uh, certifications and coaching trainings, you get a lot of training, but only in stuff that you absolutely need to know. Oh, that's so beautiful. And I will tell you as someone who has read many of your books, inclu including Conscious Loving, that these are concepts that everyone needs to know and everyone can benefit from. So just as much as maybe being on that little show in Chicago with this gal named Oprah changed your <laughs> life. I know that the work that you are putting out there has has multiplied and changed so many others because these concepts are so important. And your relationship with Katie is just such a beautiful model for what a great relationship can be, um, you know, and based on what I know from hearing you speak and hearing you write, would you speak to your relationship a little bit with her and how that's like, how, um, that's evolved over time? Yes. Well, in my teens and my twenties, I did probably what a lot of people do, which has had a lot of different kinds of relationships. And it took me a while to notice, but my relationships, I described eventually in my 20s, I began to wake up to, hmm, why don't my relationships ever, ever go anywhere? Or, you know, I, I'd had my heart broken a couple of times, so I was probably resistant to getting into a deep loving relationship again. But anyway, during my 20s, I created a lot of unsatisfying relationships. And I always say my relationships in my 20s had the trajectory of the Titanic. <laughs> they would all start out with a great deal of fanfare. And then I'd hit the iceberg after six months or so. And it took me many years to realize that I was the iceberg. There was no <laughs> iceberg out there. And I, I had a big wake up moment. I was in a relationship on and off for, well, from about 1975 to about 1979 with a wonderful woman, but we kept having the same arguments over and over and over again. And on this one magic day in 1979, I had a wake up moment. I realized that we weren't, we were in the middle of an argument and I realized, oh, 
this isn't our 500th argument in the last four years. This is our 500th version of the same argument. And that was like a, oh, uh, a wake up moment for me. And, and I, I, I was standing there. I can even remember where I was standing in the middle of her living room. And we'd been having this argument and I, I kind of went silent. And I had this realization, oh, our arguments always follow the same pattern. And then it just downloaded what the pattern was. One of us would fail to tell the truth to the other one about something maybe as simple as, you know, if the other person says, are you mad at me about something? And you say, no, you know, like that kind of thing. <laughs> uh -huh. um, if one of us didn't tell the truth about something, we would then get into an argument later on. Mm -hmm. So I realized that wow, what if we had a relationship where we committed to speaking honestly to each other? And that was our main commitment. And then the second thing it dawned on me, oh, I create conflict in this relationship. When stress comes up, I go into the victim position and blame her for causing the problem. And she does the same thing. She then goes into the victim position and blames me for everything. And then we go round and round as two fellow victims, both of us thinking we're the victim until somehow we you know, sleep it off or uh, make up and kiss and make up or buy a major appliance or something that gets <laughs> us back together again. <laughs> and so that was, oh, the third thing I had during this little, it was like a 10 second insight. One was honesty. The second was taking responsibility or versus blame. And the third one, I realized that we created conflict when we were out of harmony with our own creative process. Mm -hmm. When I wasn't expressing my creativity or when she wasn't expressing her creativity, then we would create problems between us that we would then use to distract us from the fact that we weren't expressing our creative potential with each other. And so that was a huge moment of realization where suddenly I saw the pattern mm. and I was never the same again because what happened was she looked over at me and she said, what's going on? You haven't said a word there. You know, it's like, uh, where have you gone? And I told her that I just had this big realization and I explained the realization and I was saying, let's commit to a relationship where we always express the truth to each other and let's commit to a new kind of relationship where we take responsibility instead of going for the victim position we say hmm why am i creating this argument with you right now mm -hmm. and the third thing was let's both make a heightened commitment to our creativity because if we did that, we wouldn't even have time or urge to have a conflict with each other. And I expected her to jump up and down and say, yes, let's do that. That seemed like the best idea I had ever come up with. And to my great surprise, she said, no. Oh. And I said, what? And I said, why? And this was really a stunning moment for me. God bless her for being honest. She said, I don't want to do that. I only want to be in this relationship if we can agree that things are your fault, that you're the problem here. <laughs> and that blitzed my mind because I had sort of secretly feared and, and thought that, but I had never come right out and heard anybody <laughs> say it, you know, that, that she was only willing to be in the relationship if she could be right all the time. And that did not appeal to me at all. It sounded so off that that was kind of the end. Well, there was one other thing that happened. I went back to my cottage that I lived in at the time, which was on the back of the property where her house is, was on the front part of the property. So I went back to my little cottage and I just hung out there getting really clear about what I wanted in a relationship. And I named the three things. I said, okay, I want a relationship where both of us are absolutely honest, where both of us take responsibility rather than going for the victim position, and where both of us commit to our creativity and really 
support each other in going all the way to our full creative expression. That was my dream. I was 34 years old at the time, and I'd never had anything like that in a relationship, but that just kind of appeared to me. That seemed to me what I really wanted. And so it took me about an hour to really get clear about that. And then I did a remarkable thing. I said, I actually said this out loud. I said, okay, universe, if you're listening, that's what I want. And if that's not in the cards for me, for whatever reason, I'm willing to be alone, but I promise you, I'll never settle for less than that. Mm. Okay. Even if I get lonely, I'm not going to settle for anything less than that. That's my desire. So it was one of the first times in my life, I think, where I really got clear on what I wanted and took a stand for that and made a commitment to it. Well, the most amazing thing happened. Carol, the previous woman, came to the cottage after a couple of days, uh, came to my front door and I, I said, hi. And, and she said, um, okay, I'll agree to that. And, I, and something funny sounded about it, you know, the way she said it. And I said, well, is this something sincerely that you want to create or are you just saying that? And again, bless her heart for her honesty because she kind of took a big breath and she said, no, I don't really believe that, but I'll do anything to get you back. And that was like alarm went off in my brain, like a siren, you know, and I realized, man, I'm not there anymore. And so I ended this four and a half year relationship pretty much right there on the spot. And, you know, we had stuff we had to unwind. We had a piece of property we owned together and stuff like that. But that really was the end of the relationship. And then what happened, the great payoff is the next month I went to California. I lived in Colorado at the time and I was a professor there at the university. And I went out to California to Menlo Park to the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology to give a talk and do a weekend seminar, which I'd done there many times before. As I walked into the room, there was about maybe 50 or 60 people there. There was all the faculty and 50 students and the head of the head of school and everything. And they were all there to welcome me and uh, get things going. And I saw this woman across the room from me and she just had this amazing aura to her. I don't claim to see auras, but she just had this special glow. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. And so as we went around the circle, um, and then, uh, you know, introducing ourselves, I kind of made a note that I really wanted to talk to her during one of the breaks. And so during the first break, I got my wish came true because she came over to ask me a question. And she was one of the professors there at the school, as well as getting her PhD there. She was trading teaching there for part of the tuition for mm -hmm. her school and for her PhD. And, and then she had uh, a full-time private practice too, which is how she, you know, made her living at the time. She was in her early thirties and I was 34 at the time. So she came over to me and she didn't even ask her question because in the my commitment to honesty, I said, I want to tell you something. I have felt very attracted to you. And I had a wish that I could get together and talk to you for a little bit. And then you came over. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. And I said, I would love to ask you out for a cup of tea or coffee. And I want to let you know that I just had this big realization that I only want to create race relationships where both people are committed to honesty. Both people are committed to taking responsibility rather than blame. And both people are committed to their creativity fully. And so on those terms, would you like to come have a cup of coffee with me? <laughs> and so this was a life-changing moment for both of us because she kind of, I remember her eyes sort of rolled back in her head, you know, it was probably the last thing that she expected to have happen. And, and finally she said, okay, how about lunch? And so whoosh, you know, everything went into action. And so 
we have literally been bosom buddies ever since, you know, and uh, we were together uh, for about a year and a half before we got married. And then we got married in October of uh, 1981. And so uh, we, we last year we had our 40th wedding anniversary. This year we're having our 41st wedding anniversary and uh, going out to Maui in a month or so to celebrate our uh, 41st wedding anniversary. So that's uh, our relationship. We've written, I think, 12 books together and put two or three million frequent flyer miles and done 500 TV shows. And <laughs> it's been quite an amazing ride. Uh, but this, the heart and soul of it is this flow of loving connection between us that's taken me into dimensions I didn't know existed. She's a remarkable human being, Katie. Oh my gosh. And first of all, what a pickup line. I'm just going to steal that one right <laughs> off of you. Just come right to the chase. Just go right for it. Go and, right for it. It worked for me. Oh man. I love it. And I just, you know, even if we, I don't share this whole video, I'm going to share this one. Everyone, I want you to see how much gay is beaming when you're talking about Katie. That's just, that's the love that I think everyone wants to have. And you know, the, the, usually women are the ones listening to my podcast and listening to my work. And I, I believe everyone is deserving and capable of that love. And one of the ways that we, the women who I work with block that is through an unproductive relationship with alcohol, not necessarily an, an addictive one, but they block their ability to tell the truth. They block their ability to take personal responsibility. They block their ability to access creativity because they have this other buffer, the security blanket that's coming between them and all of these things they want and desire. So I kind of want to segue into talking about the, one of your books that made a profound difference in my life, which is the big leap. And yeah. in, in that book, you talk about something called the upper limit problem. So can you explain this to us? What the heck is this and why should we be informed and interested in it? The upper limit problem is our human tendency to sabotage ourselves when things are going well. We hit an upper limit of how much love or positive energy or money or appreciation you're able to receive. Mm -hmm. So you hit an upper limit because of some old limiting belief you have, usually from childhood, about how much love and positive energy and money and all the good things are of life you're willing to let yourself enjoy. So many of us have a pretty tight upper limit, so we don't allow ourselves to have a lot of good feeling in ourselves before we have a bunch of worry thoughts, for example. Worry thoughts are one of the big upper limit things that people do. They have... 10 seconds of feeling great. And then they say, oh gosh, how about Aunt Maud that's dying? You know, or, oh my God, what about my teenage, you know? And so most of us are not accustomed to allowing ourselves to feel good for very long periods of time. And the same thing in relationships too. Many couples have got a very short attention span as far as their ability to live in harmony with each other. Mm -hmm. And- I've had many couples in here who literally say they cannot get through an entire day without an argument, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes three or four in the course of a day. And I've also had a one couple that I just thought of who came here from another state one time for one of our intensives who'd been having the same argument for the 29 years of their marriage. They'd never been able to get past a particular argument. To me, that's mind boggling because you wouldn't put up with anything else. Like if you had a dog that every day you woke up, bit you, you know, you, <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't put up with that. And, and so or if you, you kept putting gas into a car that wouldn't start, you know, mm -hmm. nobody would deal with that. But somehow we accustom ourselves to conflict and become conflict habituated and it becomes a pattern, just like every other pattern. So the upper limit problem, I'll give you another personal example. I used to be obese. And when I was 24 years old, I lost a whole bunch of weight. And so I lost 35 pounds the first month. I changed my eating habits completely. I started eating fruits and vegetables instead of cheeseburger, French fry, vanilla malt for lunch every day. <laughs> cheeseburger, French fry. Or some days I would break it up, two hot dogs, vanilla malt, and French fries. Um, that was lunch. And 
So I quit doing that. I started having things like salads. And uh, I remember the first thing I had when I started this night was a bowl of blueberries that tasted so good, but I would have never eaten something like that before. But anyway, I lost 35 pounds the first month and I was feeling better than I'd felt in ages. And I went down to uh, downtown Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard Square, and I was walking toward the bookstore where I was going to get some books. And I passed a Brigham's ice cream store. That was kind of the upscale ice cream of the day. I don't know if it's still there in Cambridge, but, uh, you know, there were the ones like Baskin and Robbins, but Brigham's was the one, you know. And so um, I looked in that, just cast a glance to the side, and there's a family of four in there devouring this big banana split with three different kinds of ice cream and everything. And I just went into a trance. The upper limit problem struck. I reached my upper limit of how good I could let myself feel. And I just went into that store and I ordered one of those. Not for a family of four, though, <laughs> for a family of me. And I just ate that thing in about 20 minutes. And for a while, like for probably 20 or 30 minutes after that, I felt like a million dollars, you know, all that sugar was coursing through, you know, I'm humming along, walking down the street. And then I got hit by the worst stomach ache. I was actually doubled over in the street and people were saying, are you okay, mister? And when all of that toxicity, the sugar and everything finally hit my digestive apparatus, whoop, I went into this huge um, set of cramps and stomach aches and everything. That made a big impression on me because I realized, you know, 20 minutes before I was feeling organically good. Mm. And then I sabotaged myself. Fortunately, I got back on the wagon, so to speak, and I started uh, eating my healthy new diet again and ultimately lost the weight uh, and kept it off for the past 50 years by and large. I'm uh, about six feet tall and I weigh about 180, 85 pounds now. So I look tall and athletic, but I definitely did not look tall and athletic uh, back in those days. I looked like a, a pear-shaped intellectual, which is <laughs> what I was mostly, never exercised or anything like that. Now I'm totally exercise crazy. I work out with uh, resistance training three days a week with a trainer and play golf three or four days a week and swim in our pool and everything. Because I think that you know, unless you think of yourself, your human body as a temple and an instrument, you're not getting the most out of it. Mm -hmm. If we think of our human body as just something to drag us around from place to place, we're not maximizing the possibility of being human. So I keep my attention all the time on two big things in me. Am I feeling a flow of good, loving, creative energy in my body? And number two, am I feeling a love, a flow of love, positive energy with my mate and the main people around me? Mm -hmm. Just keep my eye on those two things. And if I don't feel that, I say, okay, hmm, what did I not tell the truth about? Or hmm, what did I not take responsibility for? You know, so it gives you a quick way of checking in on yourself. So the upper limit problem, beware of worry thoughts, beware of every time you get the sniffles or get sick, look, hmm. Am I punishing myself for feeling too good? Mm. Mm. Uh, if you have a slip and fall, if you have some kind of minor injury, always look to those kind of things. Say, what was I doing and feeling just before that? Because oftentimes those things do come after a period of feeling good or a period of getting along with your partner. Suddenly out of nowhere, you're in the middle of a big argument again. So that's why Katie and I uh, wrote Conscious Loving is because we figured out a way to restore that harmony very quickly, even if it's been out of harmony for 29 years and you've been having the same argument over and over again, all you have to do is follow the, the set of tools that we lay out in conscious uh, loving and you get back into harmony again if you're willing to do those things. So it makes life very simple. Yeah, and it's, I mean, this is, it's a beautiful book even for people who are single, it's, I think it's just important to understand how to have that type of relationship. But something you said about, you know, being in your state when you were, you were overweight and you were, you know, kind of on the cusp of getting ready to make a change the it's very similar to the type of woman who I work with because she's on 
in this area where she's maybe like emotionally overweight. She has a lot of emotional stuff that's coming up and maybe she's not eating it away, but it, using alcohol as a, as a lubricant or as a crutch. And I don't really think that you can, you, you may disagree, but I think it's really difficult to even get to your upper limit problem. If your baseline of life is just not feeling good and is always yeah. numbing and is always checking out. So can you maybe speak to, I'm kind of throwing you a curveball here. Like how, like, what do you have to get out of the way before you can even reach your upper limit problem? Well, let me speak personally for a moment. I wouldn't be here except for the fact talking to you this day, except for something I also did around the same time as I figured out the main things I wanted in relationship. Mm -hmm. I came up with, um, I made a list of three, what I call three absolute yeses and three absolute no's mm. about what I wanted to experience in my relationship life. Mm -hmm. The three absolute yeses, I already said, I want honesty, I want to have a person who's really committed to being honest. I want a person who's really committed to taking responsibility rather than blame. And I want a person who's really committed to her creative process. I do not want, number one, somebody who is practicing an active addiction. I had grown up. in a family where a lot of people struggle with addiction. Mm -hmm. And I was born very lucky in the fact that I was born into a body that can tolerate just very minor amounts of alcohol. You know, a half a beer would be about the most alcohol my particular body tolerates. If I tried to have a swallow more than that, my body would say, yeah, you know, so I've managed to get through 77 years here, for example, without ever being drunk. And uh, so there's one level at which I, I can't speak of alcohol addiction. Mm -hmm. But what happened as a result of early childhood being around addicts, I ended up manifesting one of my first big relationships when I was around 20 was with a person who had a secret drinking habit. Mm. I mean, literally never showed up that way when I was with her. Mm -hmm. But years later, it came out that she'd been drinking all this time. And I was so oblivious that I completely overlooked it, except that sometimes she would go into all sorts of unusual emotional explosions. And then she'd mm -hmm. be a month and none of that would happen. And then she'd go into them again. And eventually, I, we found out what, I mean, I saw what the pattern was, but I was so oblivious, but here's what I did. I got out of that relationship and I got into another relationship with a woman who had a big Valium habit and smoked cigarettes, mm -hmm. which by that time I hated, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I just hated mm -hmm. smelling cigarette smoke or being around. Um, but she would tell me she quit and then one day I happened to be by our office and, you know, saw through the window there where she was puffing on a cigarette and she'd been lying. She told me she'd been lying about it for months because I got upset about it. So her solution to that was to lie about it. But I had to ask myself, hmm, why do I keep manifesting relationships with people who have a drug problem or a drinking problem or a smoking problem? And then I realized it was so obvious that unconsciously, that's something I associated with love, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that's for me, addicts are where the love comes from and addicts are where the food comes from. So that early programming, boy. So anyway, in the month before I met Katie, I did this three absolute yeses and three absolute uh, no's. And so I, I got really clear about that and just mm -hmm. said, no to it. Uh, even if I'm at the depths of loneliness and somebody comes along, <laughs> I'm not going to spend 10 minutes with them if they've got some kind of addiction going. Mm -hmm. So that became my declaration. Fortunately, it only took me a month to manifest my soulmate. 
you know, so once I got clear on what I really wanted and my three absolute yeses and nos, that really, I think, opened up a door for the universe to send somebody my way. Mm -hmm. And I took advantage of it, of course, you know, I was right there in the moment. And now 42 years later, everything unfolded out of that in the most magical way. In other words, my all my dreams came true. I didn't know they were going to come true at the time. I just knew I was wanted to make solid good on that commitment, mm -hmm. you know, never to have another relationship again that didn't fit my three main characteristics. Oh, that's it's so you are describing perfectly just the process of how the universe brings things to you. You first got out of your own way, you made some decisions to start living differently. You got clear on what you wanted, which typically isn't available to someone when they're in their own way. When you're, you know, scarfing down a Sunday for a family of four, you are not, you are in a different space, right? Then you're not usually able to have that clarity and that confidence to declare, this is who I am. And this is what I'm a yes for. And this is what I'm a no for. And then when the universe presented the opportunity, you stepped right up and took it. And that's how, but it came quickly because you laid all this other groundwork in place and this, I, I believe this type of life is possible for anyone and you've done so many intentional things and you're such a, you're, you know, you, I want to talk about, actually, this is a good segue into you're, you are such a great teacher at explaining these, how you get to the life you want, how you get past this upper limit problem, how you get to, you know, living in this life that you are built for. And, um, that's, that's your zone of genius is giving that explanation and giving that direction. And so I want to talk about this concept you have, that is the zone of genius. And I want you to explain, because this has been something that's so profound in my life and something that I did not gain access to until I made the choice to get out of my own way and stop doing things that were self-destructive and distracting. Um, but once you find your zone of genius, it's just like this magical space that you get to live in. So can you share with us what that is and all the other zones that come before it that kind of get in our way and convolute the situation? Yes. Well, here's the, the just fundamental picture. Mm -hmm. Think of your day, how you spend your day. Human beings spend their days typically in one of four zones. Mm -hmm. One thing is all too many human beings spend all too much time in the zone of incompetence where they're doing things they're not very good at and they don't like to do. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big energy drain right there. So if you're within earshot or eyeshot of my voice and picture today, I beg you examine very carefully these zones because I uprooted myself out of doing a lot of stuff in the zone of incompetence and it mm -hmm. changed my life. The second zone I want you to get out of as quickly as possible is the zone of competence where you're doing things that you're good at, but somebody else could do them just as well. Mm -hmm. One day I had a, when I was catching on to all this in my own life many years ago, I realized that I'd been standing in the post office line for 10 or 15 minutes waiting to mail a package. And it was Christmas time. And there was about 15 people in the line and one clerk mm. processing all these people. And the line was moving at the approximate speed of the Rombuck Glacier in Tibet. You know, one <laughs> inch a year, it creeps forward. And so I was getting progressively frustrated as the time ticked by. And I suddenly realized why. Because in my coaching practice at the time, my time was billed at $1,000 an hour. And as I kept glancing my watch, I realized I had just spent $250 of my mm. time, 15 minutes, standing there with a package I wanted to mail back east. Somebody else could have done that that was making $15 an yes. hour, not $1,000 an hour. And so that was an enlightening moment for me. And I started, I, I went back and uh, I think within a week, we had three new assistants doing different things after I had that realization. That was probably, gosh, 20 some years ago when I woke up to that thing at the post office. But I started doing all my life in the other two zones, which is the zone of excellence 
and the zone of genius. The zone of excellence sounds great, is great in a lot of ways, because that's where you're making plenty of money, you're making plenty of friends, you're making your family happy, you're, you know, you're doing everything right, you're, uh, you know, you're generating money and good times and appreciation. And it has a handicap built into it too, that if you spend too much time in your zone of excellence, it keeps you out of the fourth zone, which is absolutely crucial to human happiness, which is the genius zone. And in fact, that's the title of my latest book, The Genius Zone, if I may put in a plug. Oh yeah, it's great. Um, <laughs> it's a sequel to The Big Leap. And when you get into your genius zone, here are the characteristics. Check these out and see how much you're doing in your own genius zone. When I first woke up to this back in the 80s, I realized I was only doing my own genius about 10% of the time. So you're in your genius zone when you're doing what you love to do and you're doing something that makes a contribution to other people. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing something I love to do and I'm doing something that makes a contribution to other people's lives. If you will start looking at your life through that lens all the time, every day, to what extent is this hour I'm spending right now doing what I love to do and what makes a contribution to other people's lives. Mm -hmm. Now, as you and I are sitting here, you're in your genius zone and I'm in my genius zone and we are doing things that we love to do. Mm -hmm. I love to do this. You know, I haven't had to work in, gosh, probably 30 years, you know, as far as money goes and that kind of thing. But to me, Life shouldn't be about that. Life should be about finding out what you're passionate about mm -hmm. and living that passion every day of your life. I remember George, a quote from George Bernard Shaw. He died at I think 104 years of age. And he said, I want to be fully used up when I pass out of this life. You know, I don't want one bit of creative thing unspent. You know, it's a, that's the way I live also. That's the way I suggest people live. Find your creative passion. Find something that really lights you up and commit your life to doing that. That's what I did 30 or 40 years ago. And I have not regretted one minute of it. Oh, I have like the chills head to toes because that just, it feels so good. And it feels as someone who, you know, and I, I actually know many of the people who are listening are stuck in that zone of excellence. And it can be so seductive because you are, you're making money. Everything seems to be going right, but then there's something that feels off and it's hard to explain, especially if you haven't like let yourself get there. But, you know, you talked about the moment where you had, when you were having the, the fight with, I think Carol, and you like dropped into this like download that you had. And I remember the year that I decided to take a break off of, um, from alcohol. I had a really similar moment. I, you know, I, I was just, I was a young woman in my like twenties, thirties. I wasn't drinking addictively, but it was definitely like binge drinking on the weekends. And it was just a part of my social life that I accepted, but I knew I had to take a break and change that behavior because I sensed there was something on the other side. And one day I was in, I didn't know what this other thing was. I, I had like dreams and desires. So I, well, I did know I was just afraid to touch them. Mm -hmm. And I was in the shower one day and I had this moment where just whoosh, this download of clarity. And I heard this insight and it said, Amanda, you are meant to do big things in this world, but I can't see you doing them with alcohol in the picture. Mm -hmm. And I knew with such certainty in that moment that this was a non-negotiable thing that had to be removed from my life in order for me to even like have access to that genius because it was blocking me in time and productivity and ability and creativity. I couldn't even reach that creativity because there was this constant little like shadow over it. And I know that so many people feel that same feeling that they're meant to do something big and you're on the cusp of it, but you can't quite touch it because there's something else in the way. And getting to that zone of genius is so stinking magical. It's just a beautiful mm. place to be. Yeah, and uh, I just had a flash on a friend of mine um, who has now uh, about 17 years, I think, last time he told me, of sobriety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he told me a couple of interesting things. He wasn't able to really find his genius zone while he was still drinking. 
yeah. because he kept creating so much drama in his life because of the drinking and the effects of that on his family life and his friendship circle and his work and things like that, that he couldn't access that, <laughs> yeah. that thing, you know? It was, yeah. And the other thing he told me though, I don't know if this fits with your experience. He said that he didn't figure out or, or he didn't find out why he drank until he stopped drinking. Mm -hmm. uh, that he had to kind of stop the behavior for a little while, even to figure out why am I doing this to myself? Yeah. yeah. And uh, th that was kind of profound for me. I had never really seen it that way. Yeah. And there are so many, you know, the two main reasons why people drink are for an emotional security blanket and for a social lubricant. But this also weaves into, you know, I, I, can weave easily the, the ways in which the, the things, the insights that I get about the women who I work with and the work that you do just in a bigger picture of personal potential, you know, you talk about in the big leap, these four barriers to success that we often have. And in the women that I work with, their relationship with alcohol is keeping them in stuck in each of those four barriers. Um, so are you able to speak to those and, and give us a little um, some insight into how we keep ourselves stuck um, and away from success? Yes. Well, I want to tie it into the upper limit problem because mm -hmm. people always want to know what causes the upper limit problem. Yeah. And the upper limit problem is caused mainly by fear and limiting negative beliefs that got installed in you at some earlier period of time. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest fears that even successful people have to confront is what we call here the fear of outshining, mm -hmm. where people are really afraid to step into their full genius because of several resistances. One is sometimes they've been told early in their life they're not supposed to fully shine their light because mm -hmm. it takes away from somebody else's light. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you've grown up in a family where there was a golden boy or a golden girl that kind of got all the attention and energy and you weren't that person, you were mm -hmm. number three or number four, that's a common pattern where the person holds themselves back and doesn't let their light shine. Mm -hmm. Probably the biggest barrier though, Amanda, has to do with a fundamental belief that there's something fundamentally flawed about you. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people think I'm flawed because I'm the wrong color or because my body isn't beautiful or because mm -hmm. my hair looks stupid or there's a million ways we make ourselves fundamentally flawed. I'm not mm -hmm. smart enough. I'm not good enough. I've done too many bad things. So there's all these things we take on in the basket of things we call our fundamental flaws. And those become the barrier that's keeping you from getting into your genius, because it's basically, I don't deserve love. I don't deserve success. I don't deserve the good things of life because I've done something bad or because I'm not smart enough. So I want to let you know, though, that there are no fundamental flaws. They're mm -hmm. just lessons to be learned. Yeah. And you can look around everywhere in the world and point to people that you know, very famous people who have gotten famous who aren't exactly the conventional notion of beautiful, you know, mm -hmm. and lots of people who have gotten famous and rich, um, you know, they just happen to have some little particular spark to them. So there's no good reason why you can't have all the good things of life. It's a matter of just opening up and saying, not I'm, I'm entitled to it. Mm -hmm. Nobody's entitled to anything. It's just, I'm willing to receive. And one of the biggest things that I work on with people now when when people come here is opening up people's ability to receive, mm -hmm. receive appreciation, receive appre uh, receive lessons without drama. You mm -hmm. see, the universe is happy to teach us by tickling us with a feather if we're listening. It's also very happy to <laughs> bop us over the head with a sledgehammer if we're not open to listening. And mm -hmm. I've had both kinds of lessons, believe me. And I like the feather tickles better at this stage of my life. Hey, me too. And how, you know, how can we 
lean into those lesson, lean into that ability to learn with a softer touch? What's the, what's the route that you found to be the most productive? Number one, make a commitment to learning, make Mm -hmm. a commitment to learning every day, make a commitment to being wide open Mm -hmm. to the learnings that are coming in. Mm -hmm. You know, like my friend that quit drinking after a number of years, I was just telling you about him. This is bizarre. I still can't believe this. But he had a bunch of drinking buddies. And two of those guys tried to actually restrain him from going to his first AA meeting. They tried to talk him out of it. You know, Mm -hmm. and I've never seen this in person, but people tell me that when you put a bunch of crabs in a bucket, if one of them tries to escape, the others will pull it back into the bucket. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in life, the same sorts of things happen. You know, you have a friendship network that's based around your addictions. And then if you try to get out of it, uh, you know, expect some resistance from Mm -hmm. that friendship. You have to be courageous as heck to make a commitment to your own well-being. Because a lot of times, another one of those barriers is misplaced sense of loyalty Mm. to people that were there for you at a certain period of evolution, but mm-hmm. now you've outgrown them. But still that tug of loyalty oftentimes pulls people to go back to drinking or to go back. Uh, as a matter of fact, here's another bizarre story. Another friend of mine who was in one of our groups here who uh, got sober when he was in his 40s, he's on the board of his family's business. And one of the board members who happens to be a family member on the 10th anniversary of his sobriety, tried to get him to take a drink again. I mean, that's somebody who's not there for you. Right. Even if it's out of lack of awareness, it's still not supportive. How can you be that unaware in (laughs) 2022, (laughs) you know, or whenever? (laughs) Fair enough. Yeah. Um, All addictions are the same in one way. I know we focused on alcohol but all of them involve lying. Mm -hmm. I think that you can make a clear picture between addiction is that which you lie about. Mm -hmm. If it's food, Mm -hmm. if it's drink, Mm -hmm. if it's smoke, if it's uh, tobacco or cannabis or whatever it is, if you lie about it, I suggest you look at it as an addiction. Mm-hmm. Because you're you're trying to rearrange reality to fit your own perceptions. Mm. Bad move. Yeah, uh, it doesn't work that way. Uh, Frank Zappa, the great musician from back in the '60s, says, "In the war between you and the universe, bet on the universe." Yes, yes. And I think you know, in terms of lying, I think one of the biggest lies that we tell ourselves about anything is that if it's not a problem, if what I'm doing is perceived to be normal, or it's not, you know, ruining my life, then it's not something I should look at. But really, if it, you are lying to yourself, if you are doing something, anything that is keeping you from your zone of genius, that is keeping you from shining as bright and as boldly and radiantly as you're able to, that if there's anything in your life that is holding you back from that and you are not looking at it, you're lying to yourself and you're lying to your potential. And I just, you know, the thing that I, the thing that I love about those four barriers to success that you teach the most is, um, the, the first one that you talked about, it's the last one in your, in your book, but the fear of the crime of outshining and, you know, with any of those barriers to success, one of the easiest ways to keep ourselves from achieving success is to keep yourself small. And, and through that is an addiction or a habit or any habit that's not optimal. And the, the, the thing that I felt the most when I read through those, those four barriers is, you know, you're meant to shine. You're meant to be in your zone of genius. You're meant to do this thing that only you can, you have been put here to do but it's scary. It can be really scary to get to that place. Why do you think it's so scary for people subconsciously even to be in their zone of genius, to have that which they truly deeply desire and were put here to express? I think that one of the main reasons is because most of us have a kind of a twisted definition of 
genius. You know, a lot of times mm -hmm. when you're growing up, you think of a genius as some wild and crazy person living on the outskirts of town, mm -hmm. or, you know, <laughs> wild and wild hair and all that kind of thing. So I think a lot of us have a, a negative image of what genius really is. We think it's alien and strange when I think it's part of every human being's makeup mm -hmm. in there. I'm trying to make genius an ordinary thing that people just participate in every day. Yes. That if we can kind of make it non-special and available to everybody, that's what I'm trying to do. Because, you know, I've literally, I've worked with people all over the world, you know, every continent, I think pretty much. And they're all the same. We all have those same fears and we all have those same negative beliefs about the fear of outshining or the fear of really getting out there for fear that there's something fundamentally flawed with us. You know, interestingly enough, Amanda, I had, it doesn't matter what level of success you're at. I actually had a fellow call me, an entertainer call me that was having a panic attack. And I had met him before and he lived down the beach from us when we lived over at the, uh, on the ocean. And he was having a panic attack and he wanted to come over to my place so I could work with him, which he did. What had triggered the panic attack was that the following day, he was supposed to show up down in LA and get his palm prints in the Hollywood Walk of Fame down there. And it had induced, and this was a reward for 40 years of a successful show business career. Yeah. So what was it about that that triggered a panic attack? Well, it was that down underneath he was still carrying around this fear of fundamental flaw that I'm mm -hmm. not good enough, that I don't deserve this. Mm -hmm. And he'd grown up in one of those families where the older brother was the golden boy and yada, 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 you know, and he, he just didn't feel like he deserved it. And so he was actually considering calling in sick and not going oh. down to do the palm prints and the concrete. So we spent an hour just working on this. And so I'm happy to say he made the trip down. Oh. And, uh, but it's interesting, isn't it, that a person at a very high level of fame mm -hmm. could have the same kind of anxiety that a person just starting out. Like uh, another one of my uh, friends now, she was deeply afraid of public speaking. Mm -hmm. And so I encouraged her to go to Toastmasters and other things that, that, uh, deal with that issue. And on the morning she was going to do her first two minute Toastmaster speech, she came up with a sore throat. Mm -hmm. And so she was going to call in sick. Fortunately, she called me. And <laughs> I said, okay, let's look at this as an upper limit problem. You have the opportunity to do your first speech here, and suddenly you got a sore throat hmm, let's go into that a little bit. So I had her kind of breathe with it and figure it out. And again, it was one of those deep fears that just came to light when we're about ready to express ourselves fully. Mm -hmm. And one of those four old fears that we've talked about. And an hour later, she had no more sore throat. She was giving her speech, did great. So beware of things like uh, I'm not saying that every time you get sick is because the upper limit problem. But totally. But look into things like that, because especially if you have chronic things that keep happening, mm -hmm. you know, if you tend to get three or four colds a year or uh, something like that. And so because I've had a lot of people uh, who write me, uh, I always say I have the best inbox in town because of the big leap in the genius zone. Every day I wake up and some entrepreneur somewhere has uh, uh, written me a fan letter saying I, I used the big leap or the genius zone to whatever. And uh, so I, I get email a lot of times from people who have transcended one of these old upper limit glitches and now are doing something remarkable in the world. And I want to make that an everyday happening for everybody in the world. That's what I've dedicated my life to and nothing makes me happier than seeing somebody like yesterday i was one of one of our uh, graduates uh has manifested a 60 acre farm that they're turning into a wellness center and you know i saw the beginning of that dream and now i'm seeing the dream come true and they're talking to me yesterday on video 
sitting in their place down there. And so I love that so much because at this stage of the game, you know, all my dreams have come true times 10, times mm -hmm. a thousand. And what turns me on more than everybody else is seeing them make their dreams come true. Oh, well, how can we help you live out that message more? I would love to know, you know, I wanted to talk about the genius zone, but here's what I will say to you all. Please go read The Big Leap. Please then read The Genius Zone. They are both tremendously helpful and inspiring books with such simple yet impactful messages. Gay, how can we support your work? Is there anything upcoming we can do in addition to reading your books? Give us the rundown oh. of how to support that message and mission you have. Sure. Thank you. Well, uh, go to Hendrix.com. There's a ton of stuff you can do there. We have trainings, we have consultancies, we have all sorts of, we have a few hundred coaches that we've trained around the world. So there's all sorts of things at Hendrix.com, H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S.com. Uh, the big thing you can do for me is just live a little bit more in your genius zone every day, everybody. Just make a commitment to expanding your genius a little bit every day, because that'll make you wake up with life as a genuine possibility because uh, down inside there I know there's that spark that wants to be brought forth and if you bring it forth you have a great chance of uh, being happy in this amazing world we have yes and we everyone deserves to see that side of you you are giving yourself a gift but you're also giving a huge gift to everyone else who gets to experience that genius because it was it was put within us all for a reason right yes and congratulations to everyone who is dealing with addictions and getting through that and finding their authentic self. I want to just honor your honor you for yes. your bravery and uh, and your commitment and and uh, your genius, uh, Amanda, in helping people along this process. Oh, thank you so much, Gay. I truly I am so excited to share this with everyone there. You you are just a light in this world. And I love to watch you continue to light up after doing this work for for it's your life's work and you it's still lighting you up and you can truly see that through looking at you and hearing just the tone of your voice when you talk about your work and your love and we are just so lucky to have you on this planet and on this show today thanks great being with you all right thanks so much gay